can all hear me, send me a chat message if you can't. We're gonna, there's still people signing on, so we're gonna just slowly get started, but we have quite a packed agenda, so we'd like to get going. Um, welcome to the Manat Measurement Library web launch. We're so excited that you're able to join us this morning, and we have a lot to go over. Um, so hopefully um, you'll enjoy learning more about what we've been up to. First, quickly, we want to do just a little bit of webinar housekeeping. So um, we want to make sure that everybody stays muted and keeps a video off to minimize background noise. Um, we will have a Q&A session at the end, so there'll be a chance to discuss a bit more. If you have questions as we're going through the webinar, go ahead and post those in the chat area at any time. Um, it is most helpful if you also add the presenter's name that the question is directed to so that you know the session is being recorded so that we're able to share with those who weren't able to join. Um, and the recording and presentation slides will be shared on the INE website once we're finished. Um, so with that, I think we'll get started. And I um, would like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Carly Tubbs Dolan, who is the director of the 3EA um, Measurement and Metrics Initiative at NYU Global Ties, and she will be providing an introduction and walk us through the Manat Measurement Library. So, uh, Carly, over to you. Great. Um, thank you so much, Roxanne. Um, and I am so, so pleased to be able to welcome everyone today um, to the launch of the Manat Measurement Library. Um, what you're actually seeing today um, is the result of two years of hard work um, across uh, 19 different organizations. Um, and what you're seeing today um, is just version 1.0 of, of this Manat Measurement Library. Um, and I say it's version 1.0 because we're hoping that it will turn into a robust community of practice that can help to generate the evidence that we need to support children's learning and development in crisis contexts. Before I go start with a walkthrough of this resource, um, I wanted to step back a little bit and think first about what is evidence and how it can actually support children's learning and development. Um, the term evidence is used a lot, evidence-informed decision-making, evidence-based, but thinking about what that practically means in the work that you do. Um, so we have here a set of different types of evidence and how it's used. Um, that I'm going to go through very, very quickly given the time, but we are going to make these um, slides available to you after if you have any questions or want to look at it further. So one type of evidence first that I'm going to highlight is evidence program monitoring evidence. Evidence about how well or how often the programs and services that you're providing are being implemented. Um, this is evidence that can be used, that can be fed back to the program designers or to frontline service providers in order to make timely course corrections. There's evidence about uh, program evaluation evidence or evidence about the extent to which children are better off after participating in your program. Um, and this is evidence that um, can also be used for some course correction purposes, but also can be used to help make decisions about which programs to implement, how to implement them, um, and how to direct scarce resources. There's national and regional and global monitoring evidence, which is evidence at a higher level, an aggregate level, um, uh, population level about how children are learning and development over time and the quality of the services and the conditions in their environment that can help assess needs and also be used to help direct resources. And finally, the last one I'll spotlight today is uh, basic research evidence, evidence about how children are learning and developing over time and what is normative development. So evidence about what social emotional skills children should have when um, in a certain context, foundational evidence that helps us then better design programs um, and know that we are doing no harm in doing so. So with that, I wanted to provide a brief uh, snapshot of where we are as a field right now. Um, uh, in terms of evidence um, on education and child protection programs uh, in emergency contexts. So for program evaluation evidence, um, a team led by Dana Birdie has uh, produced two different reviews in 2015 
updated one in 2019 that says uh, less than 20 rigorous randomized trials of programs in crisis context. And this is um, the type of evidence, uh, the highest gold standard evidence that allows us to say, we know that our programs are causing these outcomes for children. In terms of national monitoring evidence, so evidence generated um, through international learning assessments like PISA or TIMS, um, two thirds of the countries uh, on World Bank's fragile contexts um, list have never taken part in any of these international learning assessments. And these are the assessments that will enable us to track progress towards this, uh, SDG four. In terms of program monitoring evidence, a survey, a scoping study survey that, that 3EA conducted um, of stakeholders working in emergency contexts said that 80% of stakeholders were engaged in monitoring and evaluation efforts, but they expressed concern that the tools were not providing um, accurate and meaningful information. And fewer, uh, uh, less than half of the respondents said they were actually using that information to share back to communities and the people that they were providing these services to. Finally, for basic research, um, a number of articles have been published about how so much of the research on how children develop um, has been conducted in Western contexts. And so most recently um, finding that 6% of research has been conducted with non-Western samples. So what we know about how children develop is based on research uh, with, with the minority of the world. And with that as an introduction, these are the gaps that the Manat Measurement Library um, are hoping to address. Um, and we do so starting in the Middle East, North Africa and Turkey, as the name suggests. Um, and we do so in part by providing an initial supply of measures um, that have been tested, that can be used to generate this evidence, but that they themselves have what we call psychometric evidence about the extent to which the measures are producing high quality data in the context in which they were tested and for the purpose for which they were tested. And so by high quality data, what I mean is data that is accurate or reliable um, and data that is meaningful or valid. But we know that a, a measure is, is just a measure. It's just, it's just a tool. But what matters in order to produce that high quality data is how it's wielded. So the decisions that have been made in selecting a measure, adapting it, administering it, and analyzing the data resulting from it. So we have tried in this initial stage um, to build in some steps that can help you with that decision making. So on the home page, um, if you scroll down, you'll see a measure selection quiz that helps you get started. Um, the first step in that, um, asking why are you conducting an assessment? What type of evidence are you generating and how are you going to be using it? What is the purpose? And you can see um, this goes back to my first, uh, my first slide. Um, and this is, is foundational. Asking yourself this question is foundational at the outset um, because the purpose that you're using the assessment for determines what the assessment looks like what the format should be, how long it is, who needs to report, and most importantly, what, how confident you need to be in the evidence, uh, that, how confident you need to be in the quality of the data. So for certain purposes, for, for that formative feedback, for just providing information informally for, for uh, course correction purposes, you don't need to have as, uh, necessarily as consistent data as you would, for example, if you're making decisions about who is getting what services. Um, so this is meant to guide you a bit in helping to make that decision about what measure you need. So say I am implementing a, a social emotional learning program and I'm hoping to evaluate the impact on children's social emotional outcomes. I select here um, program evaluation. Um, and then in the next stage, um, I select social emotional skills um, to identify what it is that you want to measure. Um, we encourage you to visit your theory of change, your log frame, your curriculum standards to help get more details on what specifically what skill or competency you're looking for. 
with that, I click finish um, and I get a set of results uh, of measures that have been used for social emotional skills, that have been used for program evaluation purposes. Um, you also see, have the opportunity to filter by the age range that these measures um, are appropriate for. So if I picked eight to 12, um, I would see, for example, the social and emotional response and information scenarios, um, survey. And what you'll see, uh, you'll go to uh, the landing page for a measure that includes um, a little a brief snapshot about um, the format of the measure and what skills it specifically assesses. So in this case, hostile attribution bias, emotional orientation, emotional regulation, and interpersonal negotiation skills. It provides information about the sample it was tested. And what you'll see on the right hand side is information about the psychometric evidence that resulted from this testing. Um, and in particular, the level of evidence um, of how reliable and valid uh, the data resulting from the measure was in this test. Um, and so, uh, which brings us to the second guiding principle in developing this measurement library website in which we were tr really trying to balance the need for direct guidance on the level of evidence that's available for a measure um, with a need to be transparent about what actually worked in testing measures and what hasn't worked as well so far. And so to help you with that decision making about how reliable and valid the data from the measure was, we've developed a set of three guiding icons. And so you'll see the full fruit bearing tree um, are measures that are ready for, for their intended purpose. Um, that had strong evidence of validity and reliability, but we always recommend adaptations if using it in a new context. Um, the, the, the sort of smaller tree in the middle um, is uh, measures that we thought were very promising, um, that have promising evidence of validity and reliability, um, but they do require further revisions, which we've tried to make clear, um, as well as further testing. Um, and then there's also measures that are under development where the measures had um, inconclusive evidence so far um, and are not yet ready for widespread use, but we encourage you to contact the, develop, the developer to help grow that evidence base. So to read more about the actual evidence, um, you can click on uh, the files to download below um, and you'll get a prompt to put in some information and also to agree to only use the measure for the purpose for which it was intended. Um, and this is important to us to reinforce this idea that measures need to be fit for purpose. Once you click submit, you'll be able to download a package of materials. These do vary a little bit in what's included um, for each measure. But for example, in Saray, you'll see a technical working paper that provides a very detailed um, overview of all of the evidence available um, so far for the measure, as well as some supporting materials, including a user guide about how to score the measure, training materials so that you can train data collectors. Um, and finally, that brings us to our third guiding principle in developing um, this resource, which is that all of the measures that you'll see on the website thus far have been developed by research practice policy partnerships. Um, we believe these partnerships are a key way to not just generate the evidence, but then to make sure that the evidence is usable and useful and meaningful and used. And so we convened a consortium of research practice policy partnerships um, to actually uh, generate, to develop the tools, adapt the tools and test them. And they provided this first set of measures that are now available on the MUNAP measurement library. I'm gonna turn it back over to Roxanne now because I'm so pleased that we are able to have some of them here today to present. Thank you so much, Carly. Um, so I am going to briefly introduce um, our next presenter and we have four of our consortium um, partnerships who will be presenting on their measures today in about five minutes or less. So first we have Dr. Uh, Leila Corey Durrani, who is a child and adolescent psychologist and associate professor of psychiatry at the American University of Beirut. And uh, she will be presenting on the early child behavior questionnaire on behalf of the partnership between AUB and the Ministry of Public Health in Lebanon. So Leila, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Roxanne. Thank you, Carly, for the nice presentation. Hello, everyone. 
so I'll be talking about, on behalf of all my colleagues who are a group of researchers. Not everyone was able to make it today, so I will present my team. Uh, I'll be talking about the ECBQ Early Childhood Behavior Questionnaire, which is a parent self-report uh, concerning toddler temperament. It's a scale that we've translated and validated into Arabic. As you can see, you have like cups at the top, uh, which makes it easier for a parent who have poor literacy, I would say. And uh, the scale is composed of several elements addressing like everyday activities in children. Like as you can see here, you have the bedtime, you have the different activity that your child can do, you have eating moment, etc., etc. And the idea is to try to address temperament in children. So now we have a, a scale of 75 items. Uh, that are grouped under like four, five factors like effort for control, intensity, emotional regulation, sociability, sensory threshold, and the parent would need like 30 minutes to complete the scale. You may ask me why would you use this scale? So uh, for us using this scale, uh, we can use it as clinician, as a screening tool, because we do know that if we address or we identify some difficult behavior at an early age and we can provide parents with proper intervention and proper guidance, they can be, they can modify their approach to their child and therefore the child's psychological development would be more adaptive. Uh, so parent and clinician can use this tool. We have also used it in under uh, the umbrella of an intervention program. It was a preventing, pa preventive parenting program. So if you're working with parent of toddler and you would like to see if what you thought these parents was efficient and uh, they were able to maybe be more empathetic with their child, better understand uh, the behavior and how to address it, uh, you will see a change between pre and post intervention using these uh, these tools. So I think that for program effectiveness, uh, th this tool can be also used. Uh, so how we did it, we collected data from 161 uh, mothers. They were between 18 and uh, 49 years old. Most of them, like 71%, were between 30 and uh, 50 years old. We were able to collect data from, data from multiple uh, social economical background. This is why the Ministry of Public Health was tremendously helpful, because we were able to uh, collect data in primary care centers with very poor women coming from a very low uh, SES. And uh, this range on, for also PhD academic uh, women, working women in institution like university, bank, etc. So it was from different backgrounds. And uh, this helped us see that this tool can be used in different contexts. Uh, Interestingly, most mothers were at their first baby. So it's interesting to see that those mothers who don't have experience in parenting uh, relied a lot on the parenting intervention and therefore they used this tool and it helped them better understand their child. One of the limitation was the limited duration of the recruitment phase. Therefore, wherever you will go and read about the tool in the, on, the, on the website, in the library, you will see that conversion validity uh, is not finalized yet. We aim at finalizing it like uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, and uh, the duration so was not uh, long enough. Uh, the questionnaire initially was long. Now it has been reduced to 75 items, which makes it more user friendly. And uh, we adapted the, the language to make it more user friendly too. Uh, this is pretty much what uh, what was limiting our our work as for who can use it and how you can use it so i think that it's good to start very early on identifying emotional behavioral uh, uh, 
emotional and social emotional and behavioral characteristic in children so you can use the tool alongside with parenting intervention to assess any perceived change in children emotional expression you can also use it as a clinician if you have a child who has difficulty to self-soothe or to regulate emotions then parents can be advised on how to adjust you can also use it for research purposes so for example in our mind we would like to extend this research to try to see on the long run if we do any longitudinal follow-up if there is any association with temperament at the age of toddlerhood and later on uh, psychological profile or even predisposition to psychopathology. I don't know if we will be able to do it ourselves, but if any researcher would like to do it, uh, I think it would be a nice idea. So this is pretty much what I, uh, I wanted to share with you as an initial uh, presentation of the tool, and I'm ready for any question if you need further details about how we conducted the validation of the of the tool or other matters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Layla. And if you do have any questions um, for Layla, you can go ahead and put those in the chat and we'll come back to them at the end of the presentation. Um, so we will now move to uh, Dr. Nikit Dasa, who is newly the Senior Associate Director for Research Evaluation and Learning at the University of Notre Dame. Um, and he will be presenting on the International Social and Emotional Learning Assessment on behalf of uh, work that was done uh, with Save the Children. So, Nick, I'll hand it over to you now. Thanks, Roxanne. Uh, and so today I just want to very, very briefly in five minutes talk about the, the International Social and Emotional Learning Assessment, which is a, a tool that was developed by Save the Children to assess social emotional learning skills for children between about six to 12 years old in primarily low resource and fragile contexts. So it was designed specifically for use in those contexts. Uh, it's a one-on-one -on -one interview tool with an assessor sitting down with a child and primarily uses performance-based and, and self-report questions from children. So one of the examples that I have on the screen here is from the, from the empathy section where we ask children to recognize an emotion in another child, in a picture of a child, and then ask them what they would do to help the child calm down. Uh, one of the things that I'd like to point out here is that there a lot of the questions in the Isela tool are formed this way in that the appropriate and inappropriate responses that a child can give to a question like what would you do to help this child calm down would be de developed in each context separately. So for example, one of the responses that a child might give is um, I would go and hug this child. In, in a lot of contexts, that would be an appropriate thing to do. In some contexts, it might not be. And so that's just one example of how in each context, we develop contextually and socially uh, appropriate and inappropriate responses that are then used in the tool to score uh, how the child is responding. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, one of the things that I want to point out, and this goes back to the slide that Carly presented, is that this tool was primarily developed for monitoring and evaluation purposes. So monitoring children year after year to report on indicators or evaluating program or impact evaluations. It can be used for situation analyses and needs assessments, but those are normally fairly large uh, undertakings. And because this tool takes about 25 to 30 minutes per child, uh, we recommend seriously thinking about maybe picking some items or adapting the tool significantly before trying to roll it out on such a large scale. Uh, unlike what, what Dr. Lela presented, this tool is not developed for screening or diagnosis. So we do not recommend using this tool to screen children into high intensity, low intensity programs. And it was not designed for teachers to use it formatively for tracking purposes in their classroom. In terms of what it actually measures, the tool looks at kind of three intrapersonal within the child and three intrapersonal or interpersonal skills of the child. So self-concept, stress management, perseverance. And then on the other end, in terms of the way the child relates, their empathy for other people, the relationships they have, and their conflict resolution skills. One of the things to point out here, though, is that there are several items within the relationship section of this tool that also load onto empathy and stress management and conflict resolution. So significant changes or adaptation to the tool 
will affect the overall validity and reliability of the tool. And so I would, I would recommend that you contact Save the Children or look at the guidance documents on the Minat library fairly closely before adapting the tool. Uh, the evidence itself for this tool has been generated from 2015 to 2019 as we iteratively tested this tool. The evidence for the Minat library comes from, from uh, Iraq where we tested this tool with about 620 children in grades one to four in 10 schools in Dohuk, Iraq, primarily with uh, Syrian uh, displaced children, Syrian Kurdish displaced children between the ages of about six to 12. Uh, one of the limitations to point out is that when we talked to our field team, they let us know that while Syrian Kurdish was the most fluently uh, spoken language amongst the children, it wasn't written down as much. And so some of the adults and even the assessors would have a hard time reading it. And so what we did is we used modern standard Arabic and the assessors were trained on how to kind of translate the tool into Syrian Kurdish while they were assessing it with the child. Uh, that is a limitation, but overall, we think we have very strong inter-rater reliability as well, which suggests that the tool was used fairly reliably. Uh, and finally, in terms of the recommendations we would make uh, to people who want to use the tool, first of all, ensure proper child-friendly translation of the tool. There are a lot of words like hope and stress and anger that might mean different things in different contexts, and so it needs to be translated appropriately and in a child-friendly manner. Like I pointed out in the first slide, make sure that the response options are developed and that you don't use the ex example response options that are provided in the MENAT library uh, and invest in rigorous assessor training. I think we always want a tool that can be used in a single day or can be trained for a few hours, but we recommend at least a three day training with assessors with a field test as well. And lastly, Focus on inter-rater reliability, the agreement level between two different assessors, uh, and establishing that will help you get a lot more valid and reliable results. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Nikit. Um, all right, so we have two more of our consortium members who will be presenting on their tools. Uh, next is Dr. Salchek Sirin, who is a professor of applied psychology at New York University. University, um, and he will be presenting on the academic readiness for children measure on behalf of his partnership with Bachasahir and Hatchatep University, um, both in Turkey. And you can correct you. my pronunciation also, Selcek. <laughs> is loud hearing. I think everyone explains the same thing. But it's on the other side, you know, usually I do that. Uh, it's Hacettepe University in Ankara and Bahçeşehir University in Istanbul. It's, it's really a truly international multidisciplinary team. We have uh, practitioners and, and researchers. Uh, this project originally started with Bahçeşehir several years ago. It was a Turkish test designed for screening purposes to start school. Turkey changed its policy about the age at which you start school. So we developed a, a simple measure to assess children's readiness for school. And then uh, once we uh, get to work with the, uh, with the consortium, we decided to uh, revise it, actually start from scratch in many ways uh, to design a new measure, building on our experience uh, uh, for Arabic and Turkish uh, students, children. So uh, Arch has uh, eight components. Uh, the first six are your standard components that are required to assess children's readiness for school. Those are visual perception, auditory perception, attention and memory, problem solving skills, basic concept skills, molar skills. Uh, these six are typically what you will see in, in uh, widely used school readiness tests like metropolitan tests and others. Um, they are really not, they haven't changed that much. These are, you know, if you look at measures from 50s and 60s, you're gonna see pretty much the same. Uh, what we did, you know, we, we changed, we play with, uh, work with an artist, play with the visuals. I think you will have access to all those details on the web page uh, and make it more um, uh, culture free, if you could, uh, because some of those uh, widely used international school readiness tests are uh, middle class European American uh, from years back. The number seventh uh, component here is really unique. It's social emotional skills, as you all know, and we just heard from the previous presenter, the importance of social and emotional skills for school readiness in our purpose, even more important. 
you know, kids may have all the first six, but if they don't have this, so we spend a lot of time and it's, yeah, uh, by the way, I didn't mention there are a total of 47 items just for the children. We gather data from children and teachers or parents. It's actually, we, we could stay in the same. Oh. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so we, we gather data from children. And in addition to that, for the social emotional skills component, you either gather that from teachers or, for, <coughs> or from parents. Uh, and the last one is self-care. It's whether or not, you know, they are able to take care of uh, themselves, go to the bathroom, ask for turns, et cetera. Um, so based on these eight items, we generate a common score and also a factorial score for each component. We originally designed this for screening purposes. We are not there yet. We are working, you know, it's, it's uh, the first pilot study, but essentially uh, we want to turn this into a screening measure where uh, teachers, practitioners, parents uh, could use it uh, for to assess children the, to the degree to which they are ready for school. It could also be used for program evaluation purposes and, uh, you know, any, any, any format structure that you have, either a longitudinal format or uh, experimental. Next, please. So the original evidence, you know, we, <clears throat> the original test, we have a lot of data showing that the first six components really work, uh, which wasn't that hard to establish. But with this new phase, the revised version, we are working in two different languages, uh, Turkish and Syrian samples. In each case, we have 160 participants in the pilot study, 160 Tur Turkish ch children, 160 uh, Syrian refugee children. They are all in Istanbul, in Başakşehir, which is uh, a small um, section of Istanbul. We want to keep the context uh, similar, the circumstances, SES, parents, SES are not that different. Uh, it's a low income uh, section of Istanbul. Uh, the average age of our sample was 5.5 with a, a standard deviation around one year. Uh, the youngest was four, the oldest was eight. Uh, uh, the one condition we had is that children uh, who participate in our study are not currently going to school. So as you can see, there's some <coughs> who are a little bit older. And we have a balanced, <coughs> sorry, we have a balanced gender um, sample. Next, please. So uh, when I was reading other presenters' recommendations, I realized what a researcher I am. So as you can see, all my recommendations are for more research, which is so typical. But uh, recommendations for use could be for teachers, parents, program evaluators, what I would hope though, before we get there, especially for screening purposes, I think we need more research. So I would like to see the more validation of the, of the structure that we have uh, essentially in um, refugee populations other than Turkey, um, maybe other than Syrian refugees in the Middle East. I would also like to gather uh, data from non-refugees because uh, there is really not that much in the, in the core uh, scale about uh, refugees or displaced people. It, it, we are essentially uh, assessing basic skills for school, which are not that different uh, from country to country. Uh, these are primary schools. And then I would like to uh, do a little bit more research on validation of the Turkish version uh, with uh, data from rural uh, Turkey, which is very different from uh, urban Turkey. And then finally, uh, we are just in the process of applying for a grant to get uh, the English version validated here in the US with uh, immigrant origin children. Fun. Thank you so much, Salchek. Um, and as Carly had mentioned before, one of the goals really with the library is that it's a learning community. So we really are encouraging people to test these tools and feed back the information to us so that great. we can kind of keep building on things. So I think these recommendations are actually very fitting. Um, all right, so we will move over to um, Camilla Lodi, who is, or Lodi, who is the um, Norwegian Refugee Council Psychosocial Support and Social and Emotional Learning Advisor in the Middle East. And she will be presenting on the Student Learning and Emergencies Checklist on behalf of the partnership between the Norwegian Refugee Council and the Arctic University of Norway at Tromso. Um, so Camilla, over to you. So good morning or good afternoon from Man to everybody. 
Uh, and uh, I'm very happy to, to, to present uh, uh, what we call the SLEC 26, the Students Learning in Emergency Checklist, which is the product of a long journey, as currently was mentioning. Uh, this uh, uh, is instrument is designed for boys and girls uh, from 12 to 16 years old. It is a self-reported survey uh, that can be carried out in uh, groups uh, with the help uh, of a teacher. Um, it's uh, 26 questions uh, with a five uh, a Likert uh, scale and it takes approximately 30 minutes uh, uh, for the child to uh, reply to the, the questions. So what is the purpose? Um, SELECT 26 was, was designed to, for planning, for designing and evaluating school-based psychosocial intervention uh, in uh, education in emergency uh, setting, in protected conflict and acute uh, uh, crisis. It, it, it basically um, started by the, the, the five constructs of hopeful, uh, and, and we, we have um, the sense of safety and adaptability, uh, emotion regulation, school support, family support, and present and future well being. Uh, it was tested on a sample of uh, 789 students, uh, both in Gaza and West Bank. Um, actually, uh, approximately 400 in Gaza, and then Jerusalem, Hebron H2, and other areas in the West Bank. Uh, we tested it out in 17 schools uh, from grades 5 to 10. And these schools were part of the Better Learning Program um, of NRC, and so uh, permission was uh, granted from Ministry of Education. Uh, limitations, uh, um, I think that this for NRC and the University of Tromso, it was a first time experience, uh, and, and, and therefore um, I think that you know, this tool is, is, is a proceed for purpose, uh, uh, but uh, needs further, uh, further research and, and, uh, and, and, uh, and further testing. Uh, the research was carried out also during a period where bombing uh, uh, and, and, and conflict was happening in Gaza, unfortunately still in these days uh, uh, we're seeing uh, uh, conflict carrying on. Uh, in terms of uh, the recommendations, uh, um, if used in, in, in Palestine, I think um, um, yeah, we would advise to get in contact with NRC and University of Tromso. Uh, right to Play has already started using it uh, in, in Palestine. And if used uh, out uh, in other Middle Eastern countries, uh, um, we would have to, uh, again, go through a process of uh, standardization, uh, uh, reviewing it, translating it. Uh, and, and actually, I forgot to mention that this is uh, a tool both uh, uh, in Arabic and English um, that, that needs uh, readapting in, in, uh, in other countries. Thanks. Thank you so much, Camilla. Um, so that is it for the overview of the, the tools. Um, if you would like to see more information, definitely this is at the website and there's a lot more there, as well as the contact information for the developers. We are now going to move over to talking about some of the guidance materials that are available on the website. Um, and following that, we'll have a moderated question and answer session. So I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Silvia Diaz Granados Ferrans, who is the Senior Researcher for Education at the International Rescue Committee. And she will be walking through the measurement user guide um, with a particular focus on measure adaptation, which is a bit of what Camilla is talking about here in uh, her second recommendation. So Sylvia, I'm going to hand it over to you. Uh, thank you, Roxanne. Um, so the, the, the measurement library includes a measurement guidance document, uh, which you see here, the first page, uh, which uh, will help 
which documents and helps users identify when a tool is ready to use and fit for purpose and whether they would need to adjust it and find perhaps further evidence for validity and reliability or to find a completely different measure altogether. Um, the measurement guidance provides a step-by-step -step decision making guide for researchers, practitioners who are interested in using uh, child measures um, in emergency context. Uh, the decision making, the, so it has, if you can move to the next one, Roxanne. Yeah. Uh, it provides also a decision making tree, which you can see here. Uh, that is uh, that guides users through five um, uh, key steps and questions, which are uh, at, at the top of the of the document. Um, that to help them identify um, whether they can use the measure, will need to do something different. And so I'm gonna uh, walk through some of these steps. Um, first step is uh, all researchers will need to identify what are the research questions and the assessment purpose for which they need to, uh, for, the, for which they need an instrument. And they will need to try to identify whether there's an instrument that captures the project's key research constructs. So specifically, um, basically they need to try to understand what are they measuring and in terms of the assessment dimensions that can include things like physical well-being, language literacy and numeracy, cognitive processes, social emotional processes, mental health and values and they will also need to understand the measurement, the, the guidance also includes uh, information so they can identify also uh, instruments that uh, capture uh, different types of competencies such as knowledge, skills, behaviors, and attitudes. And they ex the measurement guidance includes a description of each one of these um, concepts. Then the next question that the, please go to the next one. <clears throat> So the next question that um, users would need to identify whether there's an instrument that is adequate for the assessment purpose that they want to uh, that they want to conduct the the research about and it's if you go to the next one. Um, it provides uh, different descriptions about what are different types of assessment purposes. For example, describing and comparing performance at the population level, assessing the individual's performance, screening, monitoring, and evaluating impact. One of the things that we know and uh, has been also um, discussed here is the fact that uh, different instruments, not only will they require to be used in the context of different research designs, but also not all instruments um, are can not not all not all instruments can be um, have been developed to instruments that for example have been developed to for the screening purposes are not necessarily adequate to evaluate the impact of a program and so the assessment guide the measurement guide provides uh, some information that is relevant to identify uh, these things next um, then it provides also some information to be able to help users identify what is the assessment type that better um, can meet the needs, can meet their needs. So for example, self-reports, other reports, performance-based tests, observation tools, or social network tools, and describes each one of these and how they uh, may or may not meet the needs of different um, research objectives. Then the next step, if you move it one more, is um, that the next question that users would need to identify is if the instrument has been used uh, with the specific assessment, um, it has been used in the specific setting, the population or the context. And so for example, it's important that a measure that has been used for a different, for a specific um, uh, language group or for specific age groups in a specific context such as high, middle, low income country or emergency or stable setting. Um, it's important to identify um, whether there's evidence of validity and reliability for each one of these groups. And if not, then the um, the, um, the users then would need to be able to engage in a process of either um, adapting and contextualizing the measure, which I will discuss in more detail, or um, 
just finding a different instrument. And so for the process of contextualization, if some of the instruments that are there, for example, have been used with uh, Syrian refugees, but you are interested in using with um, internally displaced people in Nigeria, uh, which are, it's a completely different context, different language, uh, then you need to engage in a process that involves translation of the instruments and the assessment guide, the measurement guide provides very specific details about what is the best way to, and specific tips about how to better best conduct translations, then about process of cognitive pretesting uh, to ensure that um, the users, in this case, let's say children, um, actually understand what is, that the measure is being understood in the way that it's intended um, uh, with language that is um, adequate to the level of development. And finally, a process of piloting uh, where you would see whether the items captured the whole range of the distribution and whether also the different scales are reliable and valid. The measurement guide provides very specific information about what the process of translation, cognitive testing and piloting is like with, um, with uh, descriptions of the types of um, sample sizes that you need, to for, you need to do and the types of processes that you need to do for each one of those steps. And finally, um, if you go to the next one, um, uh, the users will need to identify whether there's evidence of validity and reliability. And for that, the measurement guide also provides very specific information about uh, what these concepts mean and how can they be assessed and how can they, how can you, if you're trying to um, collect, to use the measure in a, in a completely different setting or context of population, then how do, can you collect that information? How can you assess for reliability, things such as internal reliability, integrated reliability, as well as validity, content validity, convergent, divergent, and criterion related validity. So within the document that we presented, you can find very specific information about how to engage in that process and what it means. So we really hope that this uh, document that uh, I developed with Dr. Jung Min Lee also from the International Rescue Committee can help uh, researchers and practitioners who are interested in uh, evaluating uh, children's learning outcomes <clears throat> um, can identify whether they um, how to how to choose and how to adapt and how to engage in the process of contextualization and and uh, of, and the building the evidence about whether measures are valid and reliable. Thank you so much. Great, thank you so much, Sylvia. Um, so now we've built in a bit of time for uh, the presenters to or the um, participants to ask the presenters some questions. And I believe my colleagues have been tracking some of those questions. So um, I'm going to actually ask Carly to identify some of the questions that have come up and direct them to the presenter who's kind of best suited to answer those. Um, and if you have additional questions, please go ahead and add them into the chat box. I think that's going to be the easiest way for us to respond to the questions um, with this large of a group. Great. Uh, thanks so much, Roxanne, and, and to all of our presenters. Um, I'm actually going to give us a pause uh, for, a, for 30 seconds, because um, I think what you've heard from this set of presentations is that there is so much that goes into measurement that it's not simple. Um, and so, uh, and we've tried to pack that all into about 50 minutes but give you a pause to try and digest some of that information and think about if, if there are any questions that, that uh, you wanna ask us about the measures we've presented today, about other things that are on the website, about where we hope this website can go, or just in general about what it will take to build um, uh, evidence, uh, an evidence base for children in, in uh, holistic learning uh, or for children in crisis contexts. So just take 30 seconds right now. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box. Um, and otherwise, um, I will get started right after that.
All right. Um, so uh, please feel free to keep them coming. Um, but as just a first, as a general question, um, uh, and maybe this was this was targeted to Layla, um, but I can um, ask maybe all of our presenters to reflect a little bit on this question because um, I think it's important. Um, and the question asks, uh, for program effectiveness, um, you talk about um, using ECBQ um, to help evaluate mental health prevention programs such as a parenting one. Are there types of interventions that it cannot evaluate? I think you're mute. Okay. Yeah. So uh, can you can you just repeat the the last sentence? Are they what? Are there types of interventions that ECBQ cannot evaluate? Uh, ECBQ will evaluate like regular, typical daily life activities in kids. Not really something pertaining to crisis or to major changes in a child's life, if this is the question, if I, I heard well. So it's more, this is why I said it's more for preventive approach, mm. preventive program and a preventive intervention. So you will observe a child in his daily life activity, you will reflect on your observation, you will come and tell me, oh, it, he is very, very fussy when he, when he has to go to bed or to, ha to have his shower or to be toilet trained or if you refuse to give him something, etc., etc. So it's more about everyday activities. This is why it would be interesting to use this instrument by parent just for them to reflect on their uh, own relationship with the child so they can adjust their own uh, response to the child. Great. Thanks so much. Um, I think this is a really interesting question um, in thinking about sort of being very specific about what it is that you want to measure and knowing very much um, the extent to which you have a program, like a parenting program, and thinking about what are the changes you expect to see from that program and whether the measure will actually capture those changes. Um, and so this is something that I think I touched on briefly and Sylvia touched on briefly, but really going back to your, your theory of change for the program, um, your curriculum documents, so that you make sure that you can capture the change um, that's resulting from your intervention matching the intervention to the measure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, definitely, we need to be specific with what we are looking for. Um, so a question... And I just want to add that, uh, because Nikit also insisted on this, we're not here for diagnosing any child. This is not a diagnostic tool. This is only an observation that can just lead an intervention to better help parent and their kid to prevent any uh, psychopathology later on. Um, so going to Nikit, question on Isella. Um, and there's, it's actually a three part question. So question one, oh, yay. Um, is there a shortened version? Uh, right now, there isn't a shortened version, um, so we haven't tested out a shortened version in this format. However, in work that, that Save the Children is doing in refugee and displaced context, they have used pieces of the Isela tool in a larger assessment of literacy, numeracy, and so on. Uh, and so I would, I would, there are pieces that can be used, but we haven't specifically tested out a shortened version of Isela. Okay. Um, and then, great question, who decides what are contextually appropriate and inappropriate responses? Not me is the response <laughs> to that. Uh, but it's done on, on, a, on a kind of on three levels. So firstly, when we start working with a team with, with Isela at kind of the, the field office level and maybe the, the main office in the country, we start by creating a list of those appropriate and inappropriate response options. Uh, we revisit those options if we have meetings with parents or community members or during the, the training with assessors. So the assessors normally that are hired to, to collect data for Isela have always been 
from the community or from an area that's similar to the community where we're doing the study. And so they help us create uh, or, or kind of rectify or, or modify the list of appropriate and inappropriate response options. Uh, and then the third time we revisit it is during the field trial that we do with children. So we have a small field test for a day or two in a school from the same area where we're going to be collecting data. And during that, children give us response options as well. And so we collect all of those and revisit them with the assessors to come up with a kind of final list that they can use. So there's kind of three levels of that uh, process that we revisit. And that's why, once again, let me just uh, say this out loud to everyone on the call. Do not use the response options that are in the guidance documents on the MENAT website. Those are just examples. Great. Um, and I think it's a really nice way of sort of balancing between consistency um, and in the different items in the tool and building in a process for contextualization while maintaining that consistency. Um, and so I think that type of adaptation um, uh, is something that we're interested in exploring more um, as hopefully this measurement library builds out. Third part of the question, would it also work for a smaller number of children, e.g. 10 to 20 children per group or project, or is it more designed for larger populations? So we previously have not, I'm guessing the person is asking that, can it be used like in a classroom with just 10 to 20 children? Uh, yeah. And that's why when we presented that slide where we said, what was the purpose of the tool? I specifically said we, we haven't used it and it wasn't designed for kind of tracking or formative assessment within a classroom. Uh, it wasn't designed with that level of sensitivity and it also takes uh, assessors who have been trained to use the tool before it can be used for that purpose. So we haven't previously used it in just kind of a classroom of 10 or 20 children. If someone is interested in using that, I would, I would uh, ask them to contact Save the Children because there's probably more guidance around that from my colleagues at Save the Children around that. Great, and that also again speaks to this idea about measures being designed for certain purposes. So it's a really, it's a great question. Um, next question uh, is for me. Um, if we <laughs> select a measure and then go on to collect evidence with it, will that evidence feed back into the testing and validation of the measure? Um, and then how would we go about, uh, how would we go about that? Um, so it's a great question and it is of fundamental importance to having this measurement library website be um, successful. And so the thing with a measure is that the first time you test it or the second time or the third time or the 25th time, um, you might get different results. It might perform differently. And just like if you're trying to determine whether or not a program works well, um, you need to test it over time in multiple contexts to build an evidence base on the measure itself to see how it's performing. And it's only by, by building that evidence base um, and sharing that information back that we can start to determine which are stronger tools that seem to work in a of context and which tools might have more bespoke purposes. So it's fundamentally important to us that this is a starting point and that we want you to use these tools to collect the data and feed that data back to us um, so that we can start building that evidence base so we can start to be, have these, these tools that we can recommend um, with confidence. Um, so as I sort of mentioned in the beginning, we see this website as version 1.0. Um, uh, and we hope in, in phase two, in version 2.0, um, to build out a process for sharing, um, for sharing back and feeding back that evidence and information. Um, and I know this is part of INEE's sort of larger goals as well in terms of building a data and evidence repository. Um, so we will keep you posted um, on the best ways um, uh, to share back that information. Um, in the meantime, if you are interested in using the tools, um, if you have data that you already started collecting with the tools, please feel free to get in contact with us. Our contact information is at the end. Um, and so we can think about what to do in the short term. Um, another question for Nikit. 
Um, I, which is, I have heard that there is also a Haldo tool that SAVE has developed which measures similar constructs. Can you talk about the similarities and differences between Isela and Haldo? And is Haldo also available? Right, so Haldo is the, the holistic assessment for learning and development outcomes, and it was specifically designed by Save the Children for use uh, in context of forced displacement. Uh, and it's meant to be a kind of rapid assessment tool. So that's one of the key different differences right now between Haldo and, and Isela is that Isela is meant designed specifically for monitoring and program evaluations and impact evaluations. Um, Haldo is meant to be much more used for rapid assessments, needs assessments to know where children are. Haldo also focuses on um, the literacy and reading for children, um, their numeracy or math skills, as well as their social emotional skills, and covers a much wider age range of about four to 12, I believe. And so because of that, because it's kind of measuring all those different constructs in different domains for such a wide age range, it, and wants to do that really rapidly, we couldn't go very deep with each of those constructs in Haldo. And so it gives you a general profile or picture, but it hasn't, I believe, you, been used so far for an impact evaluation or in a program evaluation modality. Uh, once again, if you're interested in using Haldo, I would suggest contacting Save the Children at learningassessments at savechildren.org, and they can provide more information to you on Haldo itself. Great. And just, just to say, too, is that right now the measures that are available um, on the website, so there's two different types. One are the measures that have been tested by our, our 3EA NINAC consortium, um, uh, which you heard a, a selection present on today. Um, the second set, um, it's actually um, in uh, uh, inventory. Um, that was based on work that we have done to um, review uh, databases, existing measurement inventories, uh, literature in Arabic, um, as well as English, to identify just measures that have been used um, uh, in the Middle East, North Africa, and Turkey, um, in case you don't find what you've been, what you're looking for on the site right now. Um, and what's available today is a, a sample of, of 10 of these measures that have been used um, so far in the Middle East. In January, we'll be releasing an updated version that has over 150 measures of a children's learning and holistic development that have been used so far in the Middle East. Um, given this, the strict requirements on um, sharing of academic journal articles, um, as well as uh, some uh, challenges in, in the sharing of measures themselves, um, we will not yet have um, uh, those materials available on the website. But what we're hoping with this inventory is that at least it gives you a starting place so that if you don't find what you're looking for, you can then Google um, and uh, see what's out there and get in touch with the developer if you want more information. Um, we're also hoping over time that as, as people are developing measures that they will want to contribute them to the website. So for example, Haldo, um, if there's interest, if it's been tested in the Middle East, North Africa or Turkey or in other places, um, please feel free to reach out to contribute these measures and their evidence um, to the website. Um, next question, um, which I'm going to give to um, Camilla um, and ask Selcheck to reflect on as well. Um, what would be some best practices to encourage collaboration on measurement tools? Hmm, best practices <laughs> on collaboration. Well, I, I think the, the example of the consortium uh, was one of them. It was really uh, uh, starting uh, uh, to, to discuss uh, uh, not only uh, tools and instruments, but challenges and, and linking research uh, to program implementation. So those discussions uh, that opened up in the consortium for us, at least uh, in terms of NRC and the University of Tromso, was particularly uh, 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 precious because we, let's say, the journey has 
started, we still have some some road uh, 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 along to go, but at least it ha it kind of provided that forum to discuss the content and exchange on these uh, on the practicalities of, of the question and answer the constructs and all of that. So I would say that this is the the, the examples that that, that that comes to my mind right now. Great, thanks so much. Um, and Selchuk, I know um, you have a collaboration across it, between a, a, the NYU in New York and two universities in Turkey, um, as well as working closely um, uh, aligned with some of the, the communities and community-based schools. What would you say are best practices to encourage collaboration? I, yeah, I, I don't think they are any different from any kind of collaboration. Be generous and also flexible. I mean, we come with our you know, wherever, if you're a practitioner, researcher, living X versus Y, geography, we all have our comfort zone. But when you collaborate with others, you have to uh, understand that they also come with a similar set of values and uh, restrictions and expectations. Uh, you just have to be flexible. I mean, it doesn't, especially in places where, uh, you know, a lot of... Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, I used to say places where there's, uh, you know, political uh, disturbances, but now U.S. is one of those, so it's hard to say that we are in a different at this point. Everybody. But when when you have difficulty controlling all the factors involved in collecting data, uh, you know, you just have to uh, go with whatever local experts are suggesting, which may or may not work with your own institution. Great. Thank you. Um, so one, I think, last question that we have here, and this is more of a question um, about uh, um, sort of intervention um, th than uh, the measure itself, but I think it helps illustrate sort of some of the, the relationship between an intervention and a measure. And this is, this is for Layla. Um, can you please let me know some parenting sessions that could accompany a child intervention um, on social and emotional well-being? Layla actually had to sign off. I think that oh. she has a client, so, or a patient. <laughs> <laughs> parenting <laughs> session. <laughs> <laughs> she had the session. <laughs> So I can, uh, we can follow up with her um, to, to make sure she, I know she does have a manual actually and would be willing to share that. Um, uh, so whoever sent that question, we can, we can get in touch um, on that. Um, and are there any more questions that we have um, from uh, audience members? Um, I think we have one or two more minutes. Um, and it looks like uh, there is one, um, which is, hi, I'm working with SAVE on a project called Wuliku, which is an Android and web application used by school teachers in Indonesia to track students' attendance and track their reasons for absence. Um, one of the things we want to measure is how teachers respond to the data. In the MENAP measurement library, are there tools to measure how teachers follow up on the students' absences in a low emergency setting or an emergency setting that could be applied to a low resource stable setting. So that's a great question. Um, I'm actually wondering, and Autumn, I'm sorry for putting you on the spot here. Um, uh, Autumn, if you're on the line, would you want to talk a little bit about um, uh, Classbook? Sure. Hi, everyone. This is Autumn. Um, I think that's a great question. We have been developing an application that works offline um, that teachers can use to track student attendance. And one of the really exciting features about it is that it does like visualize attendance data and allow for sorting and, and filtering of the data um, for teachers to use and, and links to methods um, to follow up with students who aren't attending. But I, we haven't yet um, kind of experimented with the looking at how many teachers are actually following up. I think that's actually a really, um, a really important piece of it. And um, I'd be interested in connecting with you um, separately to, to discuss like what you guys have been doing and how it might, how we might be able to collaborate. 
Great. Thanks, Autumn. And sorry for putting you on the spot. Um, uh, Classbook, uh, I think, will be hopefully available in, in future, uh, soon, in future versions of the Measurement Library website. It was developed as an open source tool. Um, uh, and so, and just to say, um, we will keep adding um, to the website um, uh, updates and different measures and, and pushing that out um, over the coming year. Um, so please do check back um, and, and read your, your alert emails um, from INEE. Um, and with that, um, we are at the time where I am going to uh, turn this back over to Roxanne to wrap up. Okay, so I just wanted to thank everyone so much for joining this um, webinar. It's really been quite a, a privilege and an honor to be able to put this resource together and we're really excited to see how it'll grow over time. And thank you to all of the presenters. Um, in the chat box, you can see that there are a few pieces of information and I'm sure that we'll share this um, as well with the recording. But if you haven't been able to access the library yet, there is a link to it. It is uh, inee.org forward slash measurement dash library. So you can play around and see what's on there. We also have a link uh, for feedback or suggestions on how to improve the library. That link is also included in the chat box. I'm not gonna read out the URL because it's very long, but it's there. Um, we would definitely appreciate your feedback on that. And on the slides, you can see the contact information for all of the presenters today. There's also contact information for each of the developers of the tools available on the website. So you can find all of that there. Um, the recording will be shared. I saw that as a question that came up. So I think with that, we will wrap things up. Um, thank you all so much. And I hope you enjoy using the library. Thank you.